The Venus Project Team Speak Seminar, June 24, 2012. I'm going to talk about automation. Although I've been talking about automation for at least 75 years, and in the early days it was quite different, but our conversation about automation has been updated continuously. So when we present automation, we're presenting it from the Venus Project's point of view. Any other system is irrelevant, so you have to listen carefully and understand how we mean automation and how we mean to use it. When I think in terms of automation, I think of it in terms of a holistic system, not some industrial plan turning out automobiles or vacuum cleaners automatically. I'm thinking of it in terms of a global coordinated system. If you think of it in any other terms, it has nothing to do with the Venus Project. So what I would suggest is that you listen to this tape several times before you project your own values into it. And if and when you project your own values into it, say, these are my concerns. Again, you're getting an interpretation of the Venus Project application of automation. No other system is parallel, so it won't do if you think in terms of automation in the conventional sense. So here we go. There are millions of people today that are standing in stores waiting for customers to come in. They are non-productive when they stand in the store hoping someone will come in and buy something. It has nothing to do with the development of an individual. We do not concern ourselves with that. People standing in a store, all they do is wait for a customer to pick some object up and purchase that object. When I use the term automation, all simple jobs like that can be easily automated. We at the Venus Project consider the average person's job as boring, uninteresting, and repetitive. We think that all jobs that have repetition can be easily automated. This is not a takeover by machines. It is machines that have surpassed human performance in certain areas and they are assigned to carry out production in areas that humans cannot, such as Doppler radar can give us the height of an airplane much more accurately than a human being can. So if you understand what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the millions of people sitting down discussing things all day long that should have been discussed many years ago, and they cannot discuss it because they have too little information on the subject. In the future, there are many retirees that sit around discussing everything under the sun in terms of their own value system, which would be gibberish from the point of view of the Venus Project. So in order for you to understand this better, you have to take a physical object that you know of, such as Kibis Cane, which is a swimming place where people go weekends to swim, and it's jammed Saturday and Sunday with people. During the week, there's very few people there. Instead of building more freeways that lead out there and bridges, what we do is have one-seventh of the population off every day of the week, so it's never crowded. All your holidays, Saturday, Sunday, are all made up by people. They have nothing to do with the physical world. Therefore, if you want a world that works without prejudice, bigotry, stupidity, and repetition, and myth, you have to change the values that are no longer relevant. If we fail to do that, we will repeat the same mistakes over and over again. If you don't want your freeways jammed, just picture the same thing, one-seventh of the population every day, off every day. Your freeways will not be jammed. 
as long as you use automobiles. Later on, we will use a national system of transportation to move people with a minimum expenditure of energy, the minimum amount of people with a minimum amount of fuel consumption, electrical in nature. If you do that, you can conserve millions of tons of energy. You can save a lot of lives from being lost on the freeway. If you fail to do that, you'll have the same problems. Why should you do what I suggest? I do not suggest that you do it, but that you point out the shortcomings and show where it may not work or how it can be improved. This will add greatly to the future. If you design your beaches differently than they are today, with projections sticking out every several hundred feet, where the beach looks like a U-shaped continuation, where the lifeguard is stationed in the middle of the beach, you don't have to waste all that space for beaches. In other words, you have to plan the whole system on a global scale. If you have cooking facilities in every home, you're really wasting production. You should have restaurants where all kinds of food are prepared and you pick the kind of food you want. This is better than millions of people making bacon and eggs every morning. The Venus Project is an invasion of the old values. It's taking myths, values, habits, traditions that are no longer relevant and bypassing them. Like I said, you can take time out and wait till people evolve to this point of view. If you do that, the death rate will be much higher. The energy consumed will be much higher. So, if you base most of your decisions on energy determinants, now all those decisions that we make are in a constant state of innovation. They're not fixed. If I tell you this is how we're going to operate our beaches, it only means with what we know up to now. With constant innovation and change, the people will be updated. No one will sit around in hotels discussing any subject under the sun that comes to them. They will be sitting in front of an information screen that updates people continuously. And what they'll be discussing is updated information in all areas. There are people that are more qualified than others and they will take over the discussion. If the discussion falls short of the necessary information, the mechanism that delivers the information will interrupt and recommend an approach to the problem or method of discussing the problem. There are thousands and thousands of vending machines that give you canned fruit juices, sandwiches, all kinds of things. Most of those vending machines will be improved and together they can provide for whatever people want in the interim without any coins or money. They'll be able to access food and there'll be places for dispensing food, surplus food that hasn't been eaten. That food will be reprocessed and fed to other animals. Surplus food of all restaurants, all food production systems, all food production will be based upon nutritional needs and the taste of the food will be selected by the basis of human preference. So food will taste like what you want it to taste like. Uh, decision making will be made by what the majority selects. That's the actual way they vote. What they select is what they're voting for. If you produce all kinds of food and make it available, it's what people select that determines what is manufactured. Of course, based upon nutritional values, health and other things. If people tend to move in a direction that's detrimental to their well-being, then there's interference that is information has changed and the information is delivered to people. If for some reason or other they are unable to assimilate that information, meaning by the decisions they make, that tells us they're not able to assimilate the information. It's not a judgmental thing. If they fail to assimilate and select food that's not good for them, 
then it means that another system has to be introduced to let them know when they're going off in a direction that is not promotional to their health. So, in other words, it's not a dictatorship. What it is, is a constant measurement of values. For example, if people fail to use life preservers, if they fail to do that, there will be more accidents. So, what we have to do is inform people. And the, the methods of informing people is evaluated in terms of how many life preservers they use, not just the method put out there hoping people will use it. In other words, always statistical data to determine the effectiveness of information put out. Getting back now to information again. When you think of the millions of people going to work every day, doing things that can be easily automated because they're simple tasks. You consider that uh, machines replacing people or taking over? That's some projection by people that are not familiar with the Venus Project. We do not use machines in sophisticated tasks. We use people. Until machines evolve, when I use the term evolve, when people cannot tell the difference between machine performance and human performance, it means that the task is equal to human systems. Not until that day. When you generate an image on TV, if the image is completely artificial and people cannot tell the difference, then that image will be used. Only when they cannot tell the difference. I want to say this time and time again. Machines have no ambition. Machines do not want to take over or control people. These are human projections or projecting your own values into machines. Machines do a job, the, the job they're programmed to do. Unless the programming is, is a new installation of flexible programming that can accommodate change as it occurs, you don't need to have reprogramming all the time. If you know what programming means, it means updating machines or giving machines the ability to update their own programs in relation to new findings or events. There's always people coming up to me saying, who's going to program machines? Nobody programs machines. Machines are connected to the events. If the events are improved, the machines make a change. If they fail to make those changes, they're redesigned until they can make those changes. In other words, they used to be policemen. They used to blow a whistle and stop traffic. 90% of them are gone, except in primitive societies when technology is new. You say, well, what about the nations that don't want to use technology? We find that most, most nations that are not technical have adopted the cell phone. And if you adopt a cell phone, you have to have service. In order to have service, you have to train people to service cell phones. In order to do that, they have to understand electronics. So the nations that are unable to make the changes will be bypassed. We cannot force change on the people using military systems or, or a document which says that this is the new laws. There are no laws that are made by man except information that's put out there. And if the information does not function, it's altered. Who decides how well a system functions? By how well the system works. That's the only criteria. How well does the system work? If it fails to work, it will not solve problems. Therefore, if you do not understand that, let's picture a modern airport today. They have radar spinning, so it shows you the position of every airplane coming in. If an airplane reports that it has a problem, it's out of fuel, or an engine cut out, it's given priority by people. In the future, it will be given priority automatically. All other planes will be told to hold their position until further notice. They'll be given specific directions 
until that plane that's in trouble lands and the people get out securely, then the information is modified. It's not Fresco or any group of people sitting there making decisions. People say to me, well, you're trying to automate things. You don't seem to have a place for people. It isn't that I don't have a place for people, that people don't have a place to function. If people are surpassed by automation, then they can't function properly. And that's the only time when machines take over. In other words, they used to have a person counting automobiles as they went out to a, to a private beach or a place. A person would count them. Now they have what looks like a rubber tube across the highway. As the cars drive over it, it counts them automatically and far more accurately than any human being. So we will use automatic counting devices unless you come up with something new that's faster and better. It isn't that machines are taking over again. Only if their performance exceeds that of a human being will it be used as an extensional device. So the fear that machines are taking over is a projection. Before you try to even understand what the Venus Project's concepts are of automation, you better look into it, because you can discuss automation till you're blue in the face using present-day frames of reference which are obsolete and do not correspond with the direction of the Venus Project. If you want to know what systems will endure into the future, those systems that work, those that do not work too well, that have unresolved problems will be worked on until those problems are resolved. In the meantime, no change will be made until those problems are resolved. Now, when I use the term automation, what if the machine fails? That's a valid question. That means redundancy must be used. So in case of failure, the program can be continued. Now, if one of the major systems break down, others have been to be equipped to take over that function. In other words, the military has what we call contingency plans. If the enemy invades a new area or they send guided missiles in, the army changes its approach. So you have to have as many contingencies as you can imagine, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, tornadoes, all kinds of interference factors. Those that you leave out will leave unresolved problems. So, can you handle all problems? To the extent that you can will determine the validity of a system. Can you go over the meaning of a global systems approach? Whatever works in a given area, when applied in different areas with different stages of social development, each system has to accommodate that level of technological development or lack of it. So each system will be designed to fit the circumstances of each area. If you go to a primitive development that is a less developed technology, the system has to be designed within the value system of that area and updated as rapidly and as feasible as possible. That's the only way. If you don't check with the Venus Project, you're going to have all kinds of irrelevant discussion. And I'll say 90% of the discussion is irrelevant to the direction of the Venus Project. Now, how do you get it? You come out here on tours, you read our books, you make notes of what you don't understand, and you inquire into how will this or that problem be resolved? How will it be handled? What are the problems that you can't handle? Then what? In other words, uh, you have to question things, but not project your own answers in there, unless you have a newer way of doing things that's simplified and more efficient. In other words, what I'm doing is immediately taking away millions of people from performances that do not count, such as storekeepers, vendors, cashiers, all of that can be automated. And so you say, 
is there enough material to go around? There's by far more than enough material to go around if we use the Venus Project's proposals of social operation. That all the monotonous jobs will be automated. That all vending machines will vend whatever it is people need. And all people that are non-productive will go back to school because they're, they're educated to understand that if they perform a useful task to society, they themselves will benefit, so will everyone else. And a useful task is that which enables society to function well. A useful task is how well the system works. No matter what I advocate, if the system does not work, it would not be a useful task. In other words, instead of you going in every month to have your eyes checked, your eyes will be checked on the job by what you're doing. The automated system of your job will check your visual and recommend that you go in for examination. You don't have to be checked out by an optometrist. What you do, your job will have a built-in system that scans you and maintains your health, just as the health department does. It has the same equipment, only it doesn't look that way. It looks like part of your job. If you have fainting spells, all that is picked up. But medicine, doctors are not people who create automatic diagnostic machines. They work in conjunction with engineers, electronics experts, and tell them what it is that they need. And the engineers of the future will be medical engineering, which devise mechanisms to tell how well your eyes are working, how stable your system is, whether the semicircular canal is infected, all of those things. If you cannot define those terms, you can't build the civilization I'm talking about. And people say to me, what about the unknown? Well, if it's unknown, you can't deal with it. You can only deal with known things. The guy says, what if there's an invasion from Mars? Well, now you can bring up all kinds of crap. What if the Earth splits in half? Then what? And you live on the other one half and the other people live on the other half. <laughs> it's ridiculous concepts. You're dealing with sick people with a value system that's completely irrelevant. Remember this. Saturday, Sunday, Monday are man-made days. They have nothing to do with the world of reality. You know, have a nice weekend has nothing to do with having a nice weekend. Controlling the weather is what you really want. Well, how do you do that? and you go back to school and study meteorology, the weather and the prime effectors of weather. Studying that will not give you weather control, but it will bring you closer to weather control. The more you know about the weather, the more influence you'll have on safety and other factors. If you know nothing about the subject, you can only add verbal gibberish to the conversation. And most normal people engage in verbal gibberish. Sorry to say that. I wish it were different. Does anybody want to add in reading the questions? I'll give it to all of us here. Andrew, Daniel, Sean, Evgeny, Joe, Vixie, Stan, Aisha, Axel. Everybody here has to attempt to answer these questions as best you can. And if you can't, it's not a problem. And also remember, if it's specific to Jacques or Roxanne, we can make an attempt at the answer, but it likely should be safe for them to answer it. And we might even have Joel from the Venus Project coming back to answer some questions. I will begin reading the questions and speak up if you'd like to answer it. All right, if aesthetics don't play a role in your designs, how will you arrive to the decision to the layout of the city housing band in such a way that occupants from one house cannot see another house from theirs? Isn't it more efficient to put the houses closer together? I could try and answer that. I'm not 100% sure. From what I understand, the houses and, and so on will be laid out in such a way with gardens and so on between them so that it will give the impression of, you know, you won't be able to be seen. It will give you the impression of being more isolated, more alone. For the buildings, such as apartment blocks, I think it's something to do with the design the shape of the design in an S shape or something like that. I only heard 
something about this on one of those lectures from the 70s and Jack must have been drawing at the time so without that diagram it's difficult to really get an idea but I think it's something to do with an S shape. Andrew you probably know better. Hi, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a crack at this one. Okay, Jack's designs are constantly changing. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but you know, I've been working with Jack now for almost four years on doing 3D modeling of his designs and stuff. Uh, sorry, three and a half years. And nearly every time we do drawings for him, they normally change halfway through and we end up revising them many times. Some of the older models that you see with some of the housing zones and stuff, Jack's got a very different view on that for the future in that you probably, probably eventually we won't actually have individual homes within the city because it is inefficient as far as the amount of land usage etc. And Jack feels that eventually people will want to live in these larger apartment blocks which very different again very different from the kind of apartment blocks you have nowadays. These would be total city enclosures which basically means that inside each of the towers you would have all of the amenities that you'd normally have within the city itself but obviously close to hand, so things like a gym in the building, things like access centres so that you can pick up anything you want as far as sort of shopping kind of ideas and stuff go as far as picking clothes up or food or whatever. Basically, if you imagine a cruise ship where basically you have people that are on the cruise ship, they stay on the ship, it goes in the middle of the ocean and it travels months and months around the world. They don't need anything from the outside because everything's actually on the ship. You have the same situation within the apartment blocks that Jack talks about. So basically an enclosed system. Basically the houses that you see at the moment would probably be transitionary. That people are used to having homes at the moment, individual homes with their own bits of land, etc. We feel that over the years people will start to develop a very different behaviour as far as how they see a home and its function, etc. Especially with people being able to travel all over the world, wherever they want, whenever they want. It's very unlikely people will actually want to live in one place for all of their lives. Yeah, that's basically it. All right, next one. How is finding a scriptwriter to write the TVP big budget movie going? Okay, I'll give a little update on that. They recently met with a guy who came here who is semi-professional or professional, I'm not sure what, how to word it, but, and he has agreed to go ahead and proceed on that. And so this is a significant step in that direction. Yeah, and previous to that, they've been through many script writers and too often the script writers have a lot of enthusiasm, but not a lot of direct knowledge of the Venus Project resource-based economy. And as most of us know here, it takes a lot of work to do that. It's tough to find people willing to put in that amount of work and also have willingness to work directly with Jacques and Roxanne throughout the entirety of the script. Yeah, and I'll just add that this guy is a professional and he is being contracted to work on it. So this could be a significant step, but I've also seen quite a number of people come through and give it a run. At, ooh, I may have to turn off because we have a lot of lightning. All right, we'll carry on. Third question, can you explain how constructive criticism is important and maybe give an example? Should one take constructive criticism personally? That's from the FAQ number 44. The thing is, if somebody criticizes you and if you get it personally, it doesn't do anything for you or the person who trying to criticize. Constructive criticism should be based on the physical reality it has physical basis. For example, if I would like to criticize somebody else's work, I should present the shortcomings of that work. So if you design, for example, bridge, and I see you plan, from my experience, I see you, your beams look thinner than it should be, your materials that you use, you can find a better material for that, so I can point it out to you. But if I look on your design and says, oh, it's shit, not, never going to work, that's not a criticism. I'm showing my ego to you. So that's the difference. Yeah, I agree with that. Another aspect that Jacques might add to this, and I've heard him add to it, is that criticism is great if you have the background and an expertise in that area. It's really hard to critique something based on a limited knowledge. Well, actually, it's it's seemingly and obviously very easy for people to critique, especially based on limited knowledge of what it is. And 
Jacques and Roxanne and the Venus Project have been working on this specifically for 30 years. Jacques himself generally has a lifestyle for 75 years. So while they are open to criticism, it's going to be very hard for us to come up with either something new or a better overall idea. It's not to say we shouldn't try, but generally it's not something he hasn't heard before. He's been at this much longer than we have. So the responses you'll see him give, it's because he's heard it probably a hundred times before or seen this example a hundred times before. And he's done direct research to prove that either his example or, or his idea at this certain point or this certain example is going to work overall better as a system. I'll just quickly add to that. There is actually a cultural tendency for people to believe that their ideas are somehow unique, that no one's ever thought of them before. Unfortunately, this is severely delusional thinking amongst most people. Unfortunately, people aren't educated in many areas and highly opinionated in almost all areas. So, for example, you could criticise me on my use of CAD in my mechanical and electrical engineering job, but if you, unless you've actually got experience working in mechanical and electrical engineering, your opinions really don't mean anything. They're just uneducated opinions. So you can't give constructive criticism on my work because you have no relevant experience in that area. Similarly, Jack's been working on this 75 years now, and believe me, any, pretty much everything, I mean, everything I've heard from any of you so far, and all of the people that I've met within TVP over the past four years, all coming up with the same ideas, all coming up with the same criticisms, and Jack's been listening to this stuff for the last sort of 50 odd years. So yeah, don't be surprised if he cuts people short sometimes. It's just that it's irrelevant to him, just as someone commenting on whether or not I should coordinate pipes a certain way when they've got no experience in that area would be completely irrelevant to me. Yeah, I agree, Andrew. And I just think a lot of people do come thinking they have good questions, but it really is always the same stuff. And I always marvel at how he does it, how he stays enthusiastic about it and not be bored with all the same questions over and over. All right, next question. What type of weapons would an RBE society be allowed to use in war? What type of weapons would a RBE society not be allowed to use in war? Sticks and stones only. Probably the weapon of communication and trying to solve people's problems with technical solutions rather than with guns and bombs. Now, on a serious note, if you look at the reasons behind wars, you can pretty much nail down that all wars are caused by socio-economic and political problems, whether that be the controlling of resources because of a lack of resources itself that someone else has, whether that be that you want to control someone else's economy so that it will boost your own economy, such as the Americans did in Iraq. All of these things come about from problems within either the social, economic or political systems. And obviously the Venus Project feel that all those problems are technical in the sense of there is a technical solution to all the problems that we face in the world generally. And that's basically what we would do is we try and work on how you actually solve the problems that those other countries are having that would be driving them towards starting a war with another country, for example. In an RBE society, well, that's an easy answer. No, there would be no weapons necessary. Actually, they'd be rendered even by the time we arrived at our RBE society. But your question might be more towards a transitional state, and you have to define which timeline you're talking about. Are you talking about now? Are you talking about during the transition? Are you talking about a resource-based economy? Resource-based economy being the mid to long-term goal. It's not the end goal, be all, but it's certainly where we'd like to be in that society. No, it's not necessary to have weapons and all that fun stuff. During transition, Jacques has said that we would need some type of defensive strategies, you know, this type of thing. But don't get that confused as being inside an RBE society. RBE society, all of that would be irrelevant. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Sure. Something to consider about the transition. People often come out with, well, you know, the values of people are so aberrated at the moment. If we build some cities tomorrow and we put people in them, how would you control the behavior of those people? How would you stop people from still killing others and raping and things like this? there would obviously still need to be some policing involved in the transition periods up until the point at which you've got a functioning resource-based economy and that the education levels within that resource-based economy were high enough that you were starting to see a very vast decrease in the amount of aberrant behaviours uh, due to that education and the changing environment. 
So yes, until we get to that stage, there would still be a national police force probably that would look after the needs of people, make sure that they're protected. You would also have that in, in the case of, for example, mental health patients where people mentally ill go off and attack people in the street or whatever, that will kill people, rape people, etc, etc. Those people would obviously have to be apprehended and taken to a mental health clinic to be treated. Now, same kind of thing with war. If someone was going to attack your cities to get your resources or whatever in the interim period, yes, the likelihood is that whatever country takes this on is obviously going to keep their military going. But the aim would be, or the specific goal of that military force would be to defend, not to attack. We wouldn't be going around the world attacking people, countries and seeing their resources. Obviously, we'd be doing that through communication and beneficial technological solutions to their problems to create a bridge between nations. So there wouldn't be a military spending budget on attacking, it would all be on defence. One thing to consider regarding international diplomacy is the idea that Jack used to talk somewhat about the Olympics of the future wouldn't just include sports and that type of thing, this repetitive sort of crap that you get over and over, but it would also include sociologists and people working towards social betterment and social issues. Okay, next one is, will polygamy be allowed in an RB society, referencing FAQ number 106? I don't think it will be, something will be allowed or forbidden. We will figure out our relationship based on what is extensional to other people. It will not have the same unit of the family, which we have today, because that unit basically evolved to protect family from their outside forces in resource-based economy. We can live freely, we can live with any person who can be extensional to us and will be extensional to the other person. And how it would be in personal or sexual relationships is hard to tell because we only can extrapolate with the limited interaction we experience now. But for my understanding, I don't think that it will be enforced on people how you should live your life. You will be free to do whatever is beneficial to you and the society. That's a good answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one other thing on that, people will have sex with whoever they want to have sex with, assuming that other person wants to have sex with them. I think that's a personal choice. It's down to the individuals that are consenting to have sex. The aim is not to have a set of rules or laws that people have to follow, but to have a set of values in the society that actually benefit people as a whole. So what people do with their individual lives really has no bearing on you, as long as it doesn't negatively impact you personally in some way that would obviously have to be considered when people sort of communicate. But I think if you'll find the educational levels raised to the levels that we're talking about, a lot of the bigotries that exist currently, as far as people's sexual behaviour, sexual orientation, transgender, for example, all of these things would be very much less an issue of what they are today. Unfortunately, today you've got a series of biases that are either culturally indoctrinated into you or socially indoctrinated into you by your parents, etc. And unfortunately, these biases are very prominent in current culture, but they wouldn't be in a resource-based economy. The word polygamy suggests marriage, more than one marriage, a person that is married more than one. In the future, we won't have marriage. So really, the question in itself is a little bit irrelevant. Okay, moving on. Earlier, I asked a question about if TVP would begin making a resource distribution algorithm. Jacques replied, yes. Does TVP or Zven have an idea on when this will begin? This will give more credibility to TVP ideas. I can answer a little bit on that one. Jack's really not concerned with specific computer algorithms. There are scientists in the world and programmers in the world that are way, way higher degree level of understanding algorithms and extreme computational methods of working out how things are distributed, for example, that will actually work on those algorithms when that time comes. What we're actually doing is laying out a basic overall plan of what we should be aiming for and a general layout of how we can achieve that. And eventually, once we're in a position where people are educated enough to actually start living in a society like that, and to a point where we've got the resources available to actually develop the first cities, that's the point when we'll start getting those sort of people involved. 
and get those algorithms done and get those systems designed, etc. Bear in mind, a lot of the systems that Jack talks about now, as far as automated systems within the city, a lot of that stuff already exists. If you go onto the TP website, onto the state of technology area, you'll see lots of videos there on automated systems and automated systems of warehouse management and things like this. Those sort of systems would be used probably in the first city, whilst we develop others, the more advanced systems with the scientists, etc., that we've got in the city. All right, anything else on that one? I think that would have to be pretty much an ad hoc approach, right? In, yeah, I mean, it's, it's dependent on the time, the technology, is that what you mean by ad hoc? Uh, it's dependent on uh, relevant to the time? Gotcha. The next one. Are you advertising for a scriptwriter for the TVP big budget movie? If so, what places online are you advertising for the scriptwriter positions beside the TVP website? Yeah, I don't know. No, no advertising for that, far as I'm aware. Alrighty, next one. How do we lead by example? You don't. You really can't in this system. You can do the best you can, but that's my answer. Yeah, I agree with that. I was talking to somebody earlier today, I expressed to him that when I want to talk about a subject, if I want to talk to somebody about, uh, you know, being healthier, living a healthier lifestyle, well, I'm doing that first myself before I'm telling other people about it and, and my experiences with it. So in that sense, I'm leading by example to tell people to educate themselves. I'm attempting to educate myself as much as I can. In that sense, I am leading by example. I think your question is more broad, probably, and you mean by how can we as resource-based economy advocates lead by example? And uh, yeah, we can't lead by example by living inside a circular city and then saying, hey, you should live inside a circular city. But we can do the smaller parts, which is being healthy, being positive, educating ourselves, do the things you do have control over at this time. Okay, next one. There are news about the film. You'll visit more European countries in your next trip to Bosnia. I'm not positive on this question. Does anybody have anything on this? As far as I know right now, they're loosely planning on going to Russia. And I think they might stop in London on the way over there. But I haven't heard anything about their going to other locations. Will they ever go to Belgium? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> The requirements for them to go somewhere, Joel can expand on this maybe, but you know, they, yeah. they need it to be set up, scheduled, they need the business class flights, and they need the accommodations taken care of because they don't have the extra money just to fly around. So there has to be a lot of work done on the local side of wherever you would want them to go first, and then coordination. And then that's all also dependent on Jock's health at the time. Mm -hmm. okay. They would also expect a fee for doing the the lecture, for example, none of us work for free. Pretty sure none of us go to work on a Monday morning, work till Friday and say to the boss, well, you know what, I like my job. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna bother charging you for it. Unfortunately, we all live in this system. We all need to pay bills. So they would be, you know, they would obviously require a fee for the lecture itself as well. I'll just add also that because of Jock's age, he's 96 at this point, and it's tougher, it's harder for him to that kind of effort. The world tour was kind of tough on them. And I think even if a speaker's honorarium was offered, it would have to be sufficient enough for them to pull away from here and miss out on tours. And so, you know, that's all stuff to consider. I'd love to see Jock speak in real sometime. <laughs> Are there Are any, there any plans, plans for like Germany, France, or Holland? Because I'd be able to go to those countries. We're waiting on you to make those plans. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it would have to be something substantial before they would consider, again, traveling abroad. I think the Russia thing is quite big. There's talk of possibly funding for a future city and stuff. Obviously, this is very early stages, but I think it would have to be something a little bit more substantial than just a straightforward lecture to get Jack to travel around the world again. Yeah, and if you've got proposals, send them over. We'll put it through to them. Cool. All right, next one. What is the criteria for finding a scriptwriter for the big budget movie? And he's referencing a link here. So I think this has been kind of addressed so far, but anybody want to talk about 
I don't know if it's very relevant anymore. We got a guy working on it, so we'll just go with that. We have in Munich, Germany, common week, the film fest, and we have a lot of prominent producers, actors, and so much. So I will try to get one of popularest um, producers. I want to get in touch with him. I think the most here in the room knows his name. His name is Roland Emmerich. He made the film Independence Day 2012 and the day after tomorrow. I want to talk and I want to ask him if he is interested to produce and to help to make the motion picture film. So I let you know when we have a positive result, okay? Fantastic. Would you be able to be in contact with Jack and Roxanne directly to make sure, prior to talking, make sure you have everything in, in line? Sure. All right, great. That's really good news. Next one, Andrew and Sean, what are your opinions about proprietary software and document formats versus Libre software and document formats? It's especially from Aaron Sejo's viewpoint at da-da-da-da, 500-year-old maps. Oh, man, this one's tough. I have to watch a video to answer this one. Post me the link or email me the link. I'll have a look at it and I'll see you next week. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Again, when I answer this one, it has to do with timelines. In a resource-based economy, completely open source. Everything's open. You don't even have the term open source anymore. It's just as a given. In the transitional state, it's a mixture of open source and proprietary because proprietary, sometimes proprietary has a much more functionality than open source type of stuff. But me personally, right now, I use Skype, TeamSpeak, and Google Docs, all completely open source, or not completely open source, but all absolutely free for my usage. And as far as I consider it, it's open source because there's no restrictions on what I need to do with it. But there are times right now when we do have to use proprietary things. I use Windows, I've tested Ubuntu, I've tested Linux, and I would prefer to be working on Linux, but it doesn't always have the ease of use or functionality that I need just to do what I need to do. So there is the ideal, which is completely open source, and then there is our current state of reality. Yeah, I'll just, I will actually just add to that. I mean, for example, in the 3D stuff that we do in the 3D team, we use 3D Studio Max and Maya which are proprietary softwares, but we use them because they're the best tools there are available for the job. People come to us and go, oh, you know, we can use Google SketchUp or you know, we can use Blender and things like this. Well, yeah, you can, but you're not going to get the same results that you'll get from 3D Studio Max and Maya. That's why the big studios use those software. I'm all for open source stuff. You know, I use a lot of open source, open source stuff, but at the same time, you'll find a lot of it just doesn't have the same quality that some of the proprietary software have simply because they've got massive amounts of investment into what it is that they're producing. They've got people working on it eight hours a day, five to seven days a week, big teams of people working on these software. The open source crowd isn't really that big in the sense of like, you haven't got people working on it all the time. Certainly not. Most people have to work for a living, for example. So I think you just find at the moment in this system, unfortunately, proprietary software tends to be of a better quality than the open source stuff. Obviously not in all areas, but generally. And yeah, it's, I'm saying with Sean, really, he's a mixture of both. And in an ideal situation, from the ground floor up, in our works to further the aims and proposals of the Venus Project, everything would be open. Everything would be free and accessible by everybody. But then you have to factor in our current state of technology, our current state of people's mindsets and their indoctrinations and their biases and everything like this. And that changes this ideal that we want. And also every day we have new people coming in and I'll give you the example. The Venus project generally is on Mac. I am on windows and other people are on windows, other people on Mac, other people on Linux, and they are more comfortable with these things. So we're doing the best we can with what the situation we have now, but yeah, obviously that ideal is there and we can attempt to work towards it whenever we can. What do you think about Newgrich wanting to build a moon base? And he has a link here, I'll link it to. I think it's a great idea for a place for the Republican Party to operate from. <laughs> I think it's total bullshit because what they propose to build the moon base, what they what they trying to build it for, to exploit the resources, to put rockets in there or what? 
it's just you know something to political think it's it's just you know gibberish yeah well the argument is based exploration in any sense is going to further technology that's the argument and then they back the argument by if it's in politics by advancing technology will help our gross domestic product this type of thing so it has a lot of it's entrenched, you know, it has a lot of strength in the argument of politicians and even some of the scientists. And I don't see it that way. I see that if we can't even fix ourselves here on Earth, then what the heck are we wasting resources in space for? And then the counter to that is, well, you wouldn't have this technology or this technology if we didn't go to space. But I think that's a relatively weak argument to be making. Speaking of Project Moonbase, you guys should see the film called Project Moonbase that Jock actually worked on that film. It was from, I think, the 1950s. Even though he says it's the worst film ever, you should check it out. All right, next one. In your seminars, you state you're not against religion, but against being used by the monetary system. If so, is there any church located in your new city design? Yes, the entire city is a church as far as I'm concerned. You know what I mean? Yes, but not everybody would know that statement, so it's, it's tough to frame it like that. I agree with that. That actually makes sense. I thought to say something different, but I absolutely agree. Because if you see the city design and it's based on human concern and based on all the technologies for investment of human beings, what else you can ask? Right. If you're actually doing what all the other religions only pay lip service to, to me, that's a church, in a sense. A church in a monetary system is an institute, it's also a company which makes profit. But when people are believing in a religion, okay, then they can meet everywhere in the nature or I think in a room when they want to see a film or when they want to make a meeting. I think this is not a problem or Bear in mind, there would be no religions that are banned. All religions would be acceptable within a resource-based economy. But the education, as far as those religions are concerned, would be a tolerance to each other's religions. Um, so there's no animosity about, oh, our God's better than your God or whatever. Um, the education level would have to be raised a lot, especially within the youngsters, so that they get the viewpoint from all religions. Um, so they've got all the information available to them to make their decisions in life. As far as actual places for people to worship, etc., they can worship in their homes, they could have a place within the city where they could worship or whatever. Just as artists would want a place to do their art, there, there would be no real laws to tell people that they couldn't have such a thing within the city. At the end of the day, what services are provided within the city comes down to what the needs are of the people. If there's a big enough need for there to be certain areas of worship, for various religions, those areas of worship for religions will be built or made available to them either outside the city or inside the city, depending on the layout of the city, etc. All right, next one. Do you think the Venus Project following is too small to become a reality when a major breakdown of society occurs? Yeah, I do. I think it's too small. We're never going to get anywhere where we're at now, but that's why a big film is a major important milestone. I think one way to look at this is if every person in this room answers honestly, have you turned more than 20 people yourself towards this direction within the last three years or however long it is that you've known about the Venus Project? I don't know how many people are in here, but there's quite a few. I'd say that the majority of us haven't done that. So therefore, if you took that as an average amongst all the people that know about the Venus Project, has everyone that you know that knows about the Venus Project done exactly the same thing? More than likely not. So we need methods of mass education about these ideas and a mass awareness about these ideas. That's what the CVP activism teams is all about. It's not about sitting on Skype and nattering all day. It's not about the various projects and stuff that we're doing in the global teams as such. It's about getting out there and talking to people and promoting these ideas to the people of the world. But similarly, this is why we have things like the marketing team that we're trying to develop 
so that we can actually get these ideas out to a bigger audience. The film is obviously our number one priority as far as getting these ideas out to the world. So that's why we're pushing so hard to try and get something done on the film and then hopefully to get people interested in funding and actually producing the film so that we can get to a large amount of people in a very short amount of time. Daniel posted the movie in the chat room if you want to see it, the Project Moonbase. Jack addressed this concept 60 years ago, 6 zero. <laughs> this is, in most cases, more than two or three times our own ages. So just to show you how far behind, in many cases, most of our questions to the Venus Project are. I think they did a mystery science theater on Project Moonbase too. It's pretty funny. All right, next one. Peer review is one of the main pillars of scientific research. So are there any peer reviewed articles published by TVP? Uh, no, not at the moment, because any peer reviews would be done by people within this system, from this system's point of view, therefore would be completely irrelevant to what it is that we're advocating. Unfortunately, it requires a change in values of those people who would be peer reviewing what it is that we're advocating in order for them to have any relevant opinion on what it is that we're advocating. Well, social design, there aren't very many peers out there in this aspect. All you can do is break down a piece of the social design, say into technology or into this part of physiology or psychology and have those aspects peer reviewed. But Jack doesn't break it down into those simplistic terms or those minute terms. It's so vast. Social design is all encompassing. It may be impossible if you have a lot more social designers as an expertise, as PhDs, to then peer review it. But at this time, you know, it's not really feasible at all. It's the same thing with the criticism. Before you criticize something, you should understand what you're criticizing. One of the examples was on the Digital October in the Russian event. They invite guests and specialists in the room so they can talk after watching movie they can talk about it and all they can bring up it was utopia or socialism or fascism or communism and they didn't get past that so it just show how people get fixed with the present ideas i'm a sociology major and i've worked in social work and i like the venus project if that's anything that's good stuff we like to hear that I talk with civil engineer retired and I try to explain it to him and I show him the designs and everything. And after watching and after reading the book and after get through lots of information, only what he was able to say, it was, oh, well, Jacques really liked to draw. So that was his review. So it, it depends on the person. It depends how you're looking on things, how you experience things. It's how you open to new ways of understanding information. Yeah, it's a good point, Stan. A typical example for me would be architects that I've spoken to that they're pro TVP, but when you actually get down and start to talk to them about architecture and architectural design and what that means to them, they really don't understand where Jack's coming from, from a design point of view on architecture. And unfortunately, they really do see architecture as art with building materials rather than a paintbrush. That's how I would describe pretty much every architect I've ever met. And I've worked with architects now for some 20 odd years. And they all seem to be coming up through the same kind of training through the universities and colleges, but it's, but it's this same methodology of egoist kind of artistic buildings that have no real relevance to efficiency or saving resources. It's all about how wonderful something looks to them, their artistic impression of what a building looks like and how great it can be. If you look at London, for example, we've got these big phallic symbols all over London, huge, great big architects, penises everywhere, the shards and things like this, all these lovely, big, huge, tall buildings. They're just the egoists, if you like, artistic impressions of what these architects think. And Jack's designs are nothing like that. So it's very difficult for people in architecture at the moment to understand where Jack's coming from, from an efficiency point of view and from saving resources, why his buildings are so simplistic why they're so modular, for example, they really can't comment on it in any valid way because they're just, they're just uneducated in those areas. Well, isn't the epitome of becoming an architect like your final project? Isn't that similar to like a thesis? 
and you put all of this work into it for six months to a year, whatever amount this class is. And the criterion for building this final project, which sets you into professional life, is I don't know how much efficiency is a criterion in that project. And positive uniqueness is one of the main criterion. And that's really unfortunate. It should be the opposite. Uh, efficiency should be the number one. Uniqueness maybe being much further down the scale. But imagine that sets them into their professional life thinking that everything must be unique and at the cost of efficiency in almost every case. Yeah, exactly that. All right, next question. And then we got one more left. Where is Jacques today? I don't have a specific answer, but I know Roxanne said that she and Jacques would be busy today and they will be back next Saturday for the tour. And also I think they'll be back in the next day or two, but definitely Saturday for the tour and Sunday for the next seminar. I just came from the Venus project and Jacques was fine. I went there on Thursday and we talked and we ate and it was a good time. And he seemed fine. Absolutely fine. Daniel and me, uh, we were in, uh, in the, by the, by the event in uh, Switzerland and we had a live stream with Jack and Roxanne there in the afternoon at four o'clock. He looks good and he's very happy about this event and much more. That's, that's a good point to pull up there actually. Thank you for doing that by the way over in Switzerland. Good job. Thank you very much. All right, and last question, which is of utmost importance. Will anything happen on December 21st, 2012? Mm, it's hard to plan, but I probably gonna wake up, make some breakfast and go to school and stuff like that. Nobody's got anything for that. Sorry, I projected my bias into that question, but I couldn't help it. I never got around to it, but I preferred to make up a nice long list of every time the world was supposed to end. Obviously it didn't happen. And there are on record hundreds of times when people have claimed this. Now I'd like to just be able to, us, us all, not just me, us all to be able to present this and the details of that list and say, look, this happens every few years that people forget what happened five years ago or four or 10 or 20. And they just cash in or they manipulate on the excitement or the fear factor of such a thing. Well, this question is based on this Maya prediction calendar, it's supposed to be the end of the world. But if you spend some time to research their information, it's the same thing when you have calendar ending what happened on the last day of December, you start the January 1st. So it's basically the same shit, but on a more larger scale. Alrighty, so that's what we have for this week. Thanks, thanks to everyone for what they're doing. Um, keep up the good work. Try and get out there and do some more activism. That's where we really need to get at. Start getting some new events going in the real world rather than on Skype and various online platforms. You know, it's fine doing that stuff, but you're really going to get some more people getting out there and actually promoting this to people in your local community. And you've also got more chance of actually getting something done within your local communities towards this direction if more people know about it. So uh, yeah, just keep up the good work and see you next week. Yes, absolutely. Use the online tools such as tvpactivism.com, the main site, thevenusproject.com, the YouTubes, the Skype, the TeamSpeak. Use all of these as what I would like to call like a staging areas towards a project, staging areas towards an event to further your teamwork, your cooperation, your collaboration, your education, blah, 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 blah. Use these tools, but don't just live inside of them. And don't forget Paradise for Oblivion. Get that everywhere. All right, so we'll wrap up here and see you guys next week. Thanks for coming, everybody. Jacques and Roxanne should be here next week.